let's get to the, you know, the specifics. What should we do? And here there's a number of very specific items that maybe we can take something away from. And I do like the book in one sense, and that Tufty at, at a couple different points says, let's not be dogmatic. I'm going to kind of talk about some principles and things you should do, but you know, if it looks really bad in your case or doesn't make sense, like don't do it. It's just that here are some principles to keep in mind. Data is most effectively presented when you get rid of extraneous stuff, extra, extra stuff. So you know, a summary way of thinking about things is we want to minimize chart junk, just like crap that's in the, in the figure. So what are some examples? Grid lines are an example. A lot of people's figures have tons of grid lines. So here he illustrates it with Playfair. So remember Playfair, this famous um, you know, British economist who kind of uh, innovated in the space of data visualization. In 1785, the year before his great commercial atlas that we talked about before, this is how he was presenting the trade balance. And you could see, you know, it's pretty good. You see the lines. You know, it's pretty clear what's going on. But what you'll see immediately, there's tons of these really dark grid lines all over the figure. And they're, they're pretty prominent. I mean, this is like, this line is thicker than the line we care about, actually, here. So the data, in some ways, is obscured by the grid. Now, there's probably a good reason that he did this. He, people are drawing these things by hand at this point, And he wants to have accurate data. So he has a grid, and he's like tracing out the points and then connecting them. So there may have been some rationale for this. But even by 1786, the next year, he's presenting something very similar. Again, a trade balance figure. And it's so much better a figure, just aesthetically. OK, there are, there are still some grid lines, but there's fewer grid lines. They're much lighter. They're much thinner. And the things that are prominent here are the, the data. The data is what's prominent in the figure. So this, you know, the same person over time, he kind of learned and iterated and revised to come up with a much more effective, clear presentation of data. And this is something we can all learn from. Like, if you need grid lines, one of the things that Tufty says is like, make them really light and gray, and don't let them swamp the data. The data has to be front and center in any of our presentations of, uh, of data. That's one thing. Another thing that you see, and you see this a lot in people's figures, is people use excessive decoration and color and all these really annoying patterns. You know, in Excel or in a lot of statistical programs, there are these sort of like defaults. So if I have five categories of variable or something, the default is you know one is checkered and one is stripes and one is crosshatch and whatever, and people just go with the default because it's kind of, uh, of useful. But a lot of those patterns are just terrible. They're visually terrible and um, they really distract from the data. So he gives an example from a long time ago. This is from like the 1920s. But it was just like the ultimate example. Uh, and this is before. You can't blame computer software for this. This is 1927. Um, and like, do you really need these cross hatches here? Do you, what is this, like a Formula One race? Like, what do I need this, this like starting flag here? And, and uh, you know. All these colors, there's labels and colors and cross-hatching. And then, of course, there's the pie chart, which you, know, you can't visually compare these quantities to each other, but you know, it kind of looks pretty and it's circular. So there's all this you know, potentially a lot of data here, but it's very hard to absorb. Um, another thing to avoid, avoid computer abbreviations or other sort of unintelligible jargon in figures. Sometimes people are too lazy, and they just kind of like leave the variable name from their raw data set in a figure. Or they use some other abbreviation that means something to them. It's like shockingly common. Like, make your figures intelligible to people. Like, don't do that. That's chart junk, according to Tufty. Um, the other thing that chart, chart junk does is it fills in space when there's really not much data. So it's sort of like when there isn't that much data, the space is filled in with, with crap. And so he has, you know, and in this case, it's better just to have a simple table. Like, if you only have a limited number of things, observations, data points. Better just to put in a simple table. People can digest five or 10 data points. So this is an example. And again, this is some of Tufty's words on top. He says, a series of weird three-dimensional displays appeared in the, in the magazine American Education in the 70s, delighting connoisseurs of the graphically preposterous. <laughs> Here, five colors report, almost by happenstance, only five pieces of data. Since the, uh, the top and the bottom are just mirror images of each other, one minus the other. So there's absolutely no data. You could cut this in half and not lose any data. It says, this may well be the worst graphic ever to find its way into print. So again, I had to put what he said was the best one and the worst one. So here, you could have a simple table. You know, like in 1973, it was this, and now it's that. 
You could probably summarize this pretty well with two numbers. Like that number in 1973 and that number in whatever, 1976, uh, something like that. So this is truly terrible. Don't do this. OK. Reduce the use of colors when possible. So 5 to 10% of the population is either color blind or color deficient. And you don't really need the color differences most of the time. You can use line thickness. You could use grayscale. You could use other things. The other thing is, with some exceptions, and, and Tufty talks about this, but most colors lack a natural hierarchy. Some do. Like There are these kind of heat map type uh, plots from blue to green to yellow to red where your eye is immediately drawn to some kind of hierarchy. Like, you know, these pollution maps. Like, you kind of know the red areas aren't that good. Like, there's a lot of pollution there. Like, your eye is drawn to that. Um, but if it's yellow versus blue versus red versus green in, in no ordered way, like, what's the point? And in this case, it may be much better to use shades of gray or shades of blue or something that's, like, pretty easy to, to see in black and white and that even people who are color deficient can kind of see. OK, add more data into your graphic. Make your graphic more data rich. There's a lot of ways of doing this. You know, sometimes we have a scatter plot, and we could easily put a symbol or an abbreviation denoting different types of observations. And that adds richness to the figure. You know, sometimes people put country observations. Sometimes you might be able to put uh, symbols. Let's say you had you know, 500 people, and they, they were different ages or different genders. You might be able to incorporate that into the figure. And if you abstract away from that, you'll still get the the scatter plot you had before, but you might see some interesting patterns. Or others may notice patterns for subgroups. It's pretty easy to do. It makes your, your graphic much more data rich. So we should try to do that when possible. Um, and you know, in some ways, as we bring more and more data, and you know, data points have classifiers and other things, we create something that may look a little bit like a hybrid figure table. And maybe that's kind of the ideal. So this is an example of famous 1919. Uh, plot where each uh, data point here, every, every entry, is the number of an army unit for the US Army that went to Europe during World War I, month by month. And you can immediately see a bunch of things. You can see the number of units that were in Europe in each month. That's the height. You can see how long each unit was in Europe. That's the sort of width of the figure, sort of between when they show up and, and the end of the war. And you know which ones were there. So this is like an incredibly simple figure. It takes up very little space. It's, it's incredibly data rich. And basically, every item here is data. Replace the full access going to the origin and back out with <coughs> the data range. So let's say you know the access goes from 0 to 100, but all my data is between 20 and 70. Only plot the access from 20 to 70. Now, all of a sudden, you've taken something that had no data, and it is data. It tells you the max and the min. Like, how much did you lose by doing that? Actually, you've gained. Now we can see the max and the min in the figure. Everybody knows like, where they would intersect at 0, but who cares? Like, that isn't data. There's nothing new there. So that's one way to do it. The other thing is there may be simple ways of portraying the distribution of the data on the axes. Here's a scatter plot, and you know, this would be x and y, whatever. We may care about that for some reason. But what he has here are tick marks wherever there's data. So now I have the univariate distribution of x and the univariate distribution of y, and I can just see it visually. Kind of a very similar point, a related point, is to try to integrate graphics, data, and text together kind of more broadly. You know, famous early scientists like Leonardo da Vinci, or you know, artist scientists like Leonardo da Vinci, Galileo, etc., all their notes were littered with graphics. And they integrated them throughout. They would be writing and integrate what they were talking about together. And there was no distinction between here's the text and here's the figure, the way we often write our papers. Like the early scientists integrated these things. And that was the best way to convey their ideas. And the question is, can we do this again? So here's a couple of examples. This is where I'm going to get to some, some recent figures. So one thing that Tufty advances in this sort of second edition of his book is what he calls spark lines. But you know, it doesn't have to be you know, called that or anything else necessarily. But this is sort of you know, word-sized bits of data. He's basically pushing for integrating little bits of data and text, or little bits of data that are sort of the same scale as a word. So very kind of simple idea. But if I'm a physician, let's say this is a screen. 
I get a lot of summary information here. I care about their, th this patient's glucose, breathing, their temperature. I get their current value. I get their last 12 hours here. And if the shaded area is the normal range, I get data that they're out of the normal range. So this is like incredibly tight. There's a lot of data here in a very small amount of space. So this is a pretty effective display of data. Now, this may not be exactly what we put in our research papers all the time, but maybe it is. And you see some of this in some papers. You know, sometimes when people use little bite-sized bits of data on a page, you know, 50 plots together, um, that's kind of in the same spirit as this. It's really a way to show the data in a very transparent way. And you may see patterns there that you didn't realize um, existed. What too few of us do with our figures and our tables is sit down critically with them and edit them the way we edit text. We should, th and, it's, and that's really weird because in so, you know, there's a lot of people who look at our tables and our figures and a lot fewer people who actually carefully read every word of an article at the end of the day, especially with the rise of graphical abstracts and with summary figures being the things that get circulated and that people look at, summary tables, summary figures. We should be spending as much time iterating on and revising our tables and our figures as we do our text. But we don't. We like obsess over words in section 5.2 uh, and spend an hour reworking a paragraph, but rarely, unfortunately, do many social scientists sit down for hours and obsess over every detail of their figures. Some people do, but a lot of people don't. And the evidence that a lot of people don't is in almost any seminar you're in, you can look at a figure and, and immediately think of three or four ways to improve it. 